crowds of friends here. That's good. I always feel better when there's at least three of us. You know, you at least want to make that open the day. Household. You at least want to have, like, we got to at least get over the open meeting law threshold so it's worth having <laughs> for the world to see. Um, are you okay with getting started? I, oh, yeah, more than okay. All right, then. So I'm just going to do the opening remarks. Good morning. My name, excuse me, good afternoon. My name is Lydia Edwards. I'm chair of the Committee on Housing and uh, Community Development. In accordance with Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 executive order, we're modifying our meetings to allow for us to meet on Zoom uh, and to make sure that we can still do our jobs. Um, the public may watch this on www.boston.gov slash city dash council dash TV. It will also be rebroadcasted at a later date on Xfinity 8, RCN 82 and Fios 964. Anyone that would like to testify on this matter, please email Juan Lopez, J-U-A-N dot L-O-P-E-Z at boston.gov for the Zoom link. Today's hearing is on docket 0362, order for a hearing regarding existing residential unit diversity across Boston. The matter was sponsored by Councilor Sabi George and was referred to the committee on February 24th. I'm joined by my colleagues, Councilor Sabi George, the lead sponsor, and Councilor Flynn from District 2. I'm gonna basically turn it over to the lead sponsor who could do some brief opening remarks and Councilor Flynn, if you have anything to add, feel free. Um, but joining us here from the administration is uh, Tim Davis, Deputy Director of DND, uh, Amelia Najjar, who will be, uh, who is the Senior Research and Development Analyst at DND, Joel Wool, Special Advisor for Policy at Boston Housing Authority, David Gleich, Chief Officer of Leased Housing Programs at Boston Housing Authority, Michelle McCarthy, Housing Policy Manager at Boston BPDA, and Lizzie Torres, Housing Policy Analyst at BPDA. So with that, turning it over to Councilor Sabi George. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. I filed this hearing to this hearing order to give us an opportunity to assess our existing housing stock. We all know that, that we need more family-sized affordable housing in the city to stem, stem the tide of family homelessness, but it's been a challenge to ascertain what family-sized units exist and where we need new units to be built. We also have concentrations of different kinds of housing, including low-income housing, sober housing, supportive housing, artist live work spaces, and elder housing. Some of our neighborhoods have disproportionately more low-income and sober housing than other neighborhoods, and I'm hoping that today we'll be able to dig into why those disproportionate concentrations exist, what policies we have in place or policies we could explore, in tandem with changes to the IDP and implementing the affirmative fair housing zoning code to diversify our, our housing stock. I look forward to today's presentations and, and comments and conversation, uh, especially on top of or following uh, the, the number of hearings we had earlier this week and um, hope you know through some of these conversations and discussions that we have a much broader view uh, and a deeper understanding of housing stock here in the city of Boston and, and you know what I say is sort of the work that's left undone. Uh, thank you Madam Chair and thank you to colleagues for joining us today as well as um, the administration and those presenting on behalf of this issue. Thank you Madam Chair. Thank you. Councilor Flynn. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councilor Sabi George, for your leadership on this important issue and for your support of um, affordable housing and to, and to you as well, um, Chair, Chair Edwards. Um, I just wanted to highlight what I, what I think is important is making sure that Boston is a city of not just the wealthy, that Boston's a city for everybody, especially our immigrant neighbors, low-income residents, our seniors, young families starting off, persons with disabilities. It's easy to build housing for, for the wealthy. Any, anyone can do that. Um, but can we build housing for people in need? That's the question I ask is, are, are we able to do it? And I think we are. I think the city is doing a good job. I see Tim here and see a lot of the advocates in, in Sheila um, as well. And so I think we're doing a, a good job. Certainly we can do more. Um, and that's where I come from. Just wanna say thank you to the chair. Thank you to Councilor Savi George, to my colleagues, the administration team, and especially the advocates that never gave up on the residents of the city. Thank you. 
Thank you. Councillor Braden, we've all We've also been joined by Councillor Braden and Councillor Mejia. Councillor Braden. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I'm really excited. It is a big housing week <laughs> on hearings this week. I'm really excited to have this conversation. Um, out in Alston Brighton, we have seen a huge amount of um, development, like 700, 7,000 units in the last 10 years. Only 3% of it is uh, our three bedroom size units. And, th and many of those, um, are not uh, inclu in included in the inclusionary development. Most of it, most of that, um, as most of the inclusionary development units have been uh, studios and one bedroom. So we really do have a, um, a crisis in family, uh, affordable housing for families in our neighborhood. And as uh, Anissa, um, Councillor Isabi George has already mentioned, it's a huge crisis across the city as well. So. I'm really delighted to be part of the conversation this afternoon and uh, and we look forward to probably talking about this, this again next Tuesday when we have our um, hearing uh, on the um, proposed master plan for Alston Brighton uh, because I think family housing has to be part of that conversation as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mejia. Yes, good afternoon. Thank you to the chair and the sponsor for calling this hearing. We see this hearing as an opportunity to live up to our values of information justice. In our office, we do our best to make sure that our constituents have good access to information in order to push for systemic change that we so badly need. Taking a closer look at our existing residential unit diversity across Boston will help us get a better idea of where we need to push for more affordable housing, more income diverse housing, and more social housing, especially as we approach the budget season. It's important to remember that simply throwing money at a problem will not fix the problems that exist within the system. I look forward to uh, walking away from this hearing better informed about the structural changes we need to make. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I'll just go ahead and, uh, Councillor Sabi George, I didn't know if you wanted the administration to go right into it or did you, okay. So we'll turn it, the, the floor is yours, administration in, in total. So, Tim, I don't know if you want to direct it. Well, we are prepared to uh, have a presentation, but of course, I leave it to Councillor Sabi George on what she wants to do first. No, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, uh, I am Tim Davis, Deputy Director of Policy Development Research at the Department of Neighbor Development. Um, thank you, Councillor Sabi George, for sponsoring this order. Thank you, Chairperson Edwards, uh, Mejia, Flynn, and Braden, all for being here and being interested in this topic. Um, I am going to keep my remarks really, really short. Um, I'm, uh, we are very pleased that we are looking at these issues, especially as we implement the new affirmatively further fair housing zoning policies, um, but also in our work more generally. Um, and so without further ado, if someone would allow uh, Amelia Najjar from our team, she's a senior de policy development and research analyst to share her screen. She has a presentation for us today and we will share that presentation afterwards with you. Thanks, Tim. Um, hi everybody. Uh, my name again is Amelia Najjar, um, research analyst at DD. I am just gonna take a moment here to share my screen. And let's see, can everybody see my screen okay? Uh, yes, it seems to be loading, loading up yes. the presentation. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you, that's good. There we go, great. Okay, so um, let me see if my screen is... Ah, there we go, okay. So, uh, I have a, um, uh, a lot of data to present to everybody um, as uh, requested in the order for this hearing. Um, we have data on uh, family size housing across the city, affordable housing units, section eight units, elder, artist, sober and supportive housing units. Um, we have a lot of data that we can cover. So I'm gonna keep it fairly high level and we can circle back um, to anything we need to in more depth. So this first slide I'm gonna start with shows uh, units that have three or more bedrooms. 
And we've also provided two bedrooms here uh, for additional context. Um, the main takeaway from the slide is that um, units with three or more bedrooms are more prevalent in ownership housing. When we look at all units, you can see here that 34% have three or more bedrooms. When we look at as a percent of just the rental units, that number drops a bit to 24% of all rental units. And then when we look at ownership units, the number of three plus bedrooms jumps to 58% of all ownership units. When we ask who lives in family sized housing, you can see that 28% of units with three or more bedrooms house non family households. Those are um, unrelated roommate households. And 62% of units with three or more bedrooms house family households. Um, the production um, of, of studios and one bedrooms uh, and also dorms will hopefully pull some of those non-family households out of the family sized housing and into the smaller sized studios and one bedroom units. Uh, speaking of our development, we have um, this table shows uh, all of the units permitted in the last 10 years. So as you can see of all units, most are in one and uh, one and two bedroom units. Rental units skew slightly more towards the studios and one bedrooms, still with quite a few two bedroom units. Two bedroom units are our most uh, common uh, unit size throughout the city. And then ownership skew slightly more towards two bedrooms and three plus units. This next table shows family sized housing by neighborhood for owner units and rental units. I know there's a lot of data here, so I'll walk you through an example. So, for example, all of the th of all the, the three plus bed, uh, rental units in the city, you can see that 29% of them are in Dorchester. When we look at three plus bedrooms uh, for ownership units, you can see that 21% are in Dorchester. Uh, Hyde Park has 12%, West Roxbury has 13%. Those are the sort of standouts here with a lot of larger ownership units. This next table looks at the same data, but we look at the distribution within, within each neighborhood. So for example, in Alston, of all of the units in Alston, 27% are two bedroom rental units. 20% are three plus bedroom rental units, as you can see, very few ownership units in Alston. Now we'll move into housing accessibility. We don't have specific data on this, but looking at year built can, and seeing where the housing stock is the oldest can help us understand where accessibility issues might be the greatest. Um, so this table is showing for each time period, what's the distribution of buildings across neighborhoods. So for example, of all of the buildings built between 1940 and 1959, we can see that most of them were built in Hyde Park, Mattapan, and West Roxbury. The next table shows a very clear pattern of um, how old our housing stock is. So this is showing that same data, but within each neighborhood. So for example, of all the buildings that exist in Back Bay, you can see that 62% of them were built before 1900 and another 29% were built before 1940. So very old housing stock. We can also see that there are some standouts here of um, neighborhoods that had more housing stock that's built more recently, such as downtown and South Boston waterfront. Now we'll move into looking at our income restricted housing stock. So this map shows the amount of income restricted housing each neighborhood has as a percent of their total housing stock. And when we're looking at income restricted housing here, it's all any any unit that has an income restriction income restriction on it, um, regardless of funding source. So you can see the darker colors here on the map are where there's more affordable housing. So Roxbury has 55% of its stock is income restricted. Chinatown is 49%. Mission Hill and South End are both at 34%. Then a subset of that income restricted stock are those that have Section 8 funding. Here we're talking about project-based Section 8, uh, not, not housing vouchers. 
So the map here shows uh, any project that includes Section 8 funding. And citywide, there are well over 19,000 units with Section 8 funding, which is 35% of all of the income restricted housing and 7% of our um, total housing stock. The neighborhoods at the top of the table are ones uh, where Section 8 units are a high percentage of uh, all of the affordable housing in the neighborhood. Another subset of income restricted units are those set aside for seniors uh, over the age of 62 here. So you can see that uh, neighborhoods with the highest numbers of these are uh, Brighton, Dorchester, Roxbury, and the South End, followed by JP and Fenway. And one further uh, subset of the income restricted units are supportive, uh, permanent supportive housing units. So these are uh, units that pair affordable housing with support services, generally serving some of our most vulnerable populations. Um, so this data isn't fully coded by address. Many of the projects are scattered sites and only listed in the data that we have by administering agency or organization. So. We don't currently have address level data for 66% of this data, but uh, for the data that we do have, we know that 7% of, the, of these permanent supportive housing units are in Dorchester, 7% are in Roxbury. So this table shows uh, sober housing. So you can see there are 27 sober homes across the city of Boston. That totals 444 beds and they are all in either Dorchester, Roxbury, or East Boston. And our last subset here is uh, artist housing. So the table on the left shows all of our existing artist units. There are nearly 600 units total, 33% of which are income restricted. Of all of the artist housing in the city, a quarter of them are rental units, and the Three quarters of them are condos or co-ops. These are largely located in South Boston Waterfront, South End, um, Hyde Park, and JP. Uh, on the top left over here, we have all of the artist housing units in development. There's over 200 of those currently. And you can see that the percentage of those that are income restricted is much higher. 79% than our existing stock. So trending more towards um, trying to make these uh, income restricted housing. And you can see also by neighborhood, they are, most of them are being built in neighborhoods where there's not uh, as much existing st artist stock. So Roxbury, East Boston and Alston. Uh, the table on the bottom right here shows rental versus ownership. So you can see that slightly more projects um, units are being built in projects that are rental only, and then most of them are actually being built in projects that are mixed rental and ownership. And that actually concludes all of our data. Um, thanks for bearing with me through all of those tables and data. Um, I think my colleague at BPDA is going to take it from here. So I will stop sharing my screen. Okay. I don't know if Tim was talking to us, but we couldn't hear him. <laughs> uh oh. Oh no, we can't Don't hear you. you. Oh no. Oh no, but we need Tim. <laughs> he could log back in. He'll come back in and call him. Okie doke. Um. Hmm. Um, anybody have some just very quickly uh, 30,000 foot questions about the stats? I, Amelia, are you there? Yep, I'm still here. <laughs> okay. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, yeah. I hear you fine. Did you want to be able Hello? to Amelia? You can't lose is, her too. Is my audio working? Okay, we can hear you. <laughs> okay, Amelia. Amelia? Amelia? Hi. There. Sorry, can you hear me? <laughs> yes. 
Okay. I think I, I think I froze, sorry. All right. So I was just, so I wanted to make sure, did you work, you, did, did you work? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Oh man. <laughs> I am here. So one question I have, can you yes, hear me? Yes, I've been. I think there's I think there's a major delay, like a five second delay. Okay, all right. I'll just yeah, ask. I'm my... back. I'm back by phone. Just in time. We okay. see. It. We see it it so Amelia, Amelia's here for questions. If if for some reason Amelia's in or out, you know I can take questions as well. Uh, Michelle did have a brief statement about her work there. We want to go through that, and then we can you know it can be open for questions for the rest of it. Hopefully this will give everyone a little time to handle the technical difficulties. I hope I don't, um, I hope it's not catching. Um, so I'm Michelle McCarthy, BPA Housing Policy Manager. Uh, just wanted to say thank you to Chairperson Edwards and Councillor Sabi George for having us here today. Uh, I wanted to talk briefly about the recent affirmatively furthering fair housing amendments to the Boston Zoning Code and how these amendments seek to enhance diversity in both who lives in housing, but also the type and size of housing across the city. Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing, or AFFH, gives the Boston Planning and Development Agency the authority and structure to assist developers of large projects reviewed under Article 80B and planned development areas reviewed under Article 80C of the Boston Zoning Code to conduct an AFFH assessment surrounding proposed project sites and to propose solutions for meeting the needs and overcoming barriers revealed by the, the AFFH assessment. Part of the AFFH assessment requires developers to review and respond to a housing and household composition community profile report. This report was created by the BPA's research and graphic information system staff using primarily American community survey data, as well as some data about income restricted units and voucher, hold, voucher holding households provided by the Department of Neighborhood Development and the Boston Housing Authority respectively. The housing and household community profile report provides a great deal of information to developers about the level of historical exclusion residents have experienced at the project site, as well as the size and type of, high, of households and the size of units within the project area, among many other data points, and provides a comparison to the city as a whole. The AFFH zoning amendments now require developers to make meaningful use of the data provided in the housing and household commun composition community profile report, and proposes strategies for meeting AFFH requirements of the zoning code that both meet the needs of the immediate community and creates opportunities for those who have not been represented within the community. It's our hope that over time, as developers fulfill their obligations under AFFH, we will see changes in the community that allow everyone to access the housing they need and the neighborhood they want to live in. Thank you again for having us here today to speak on this topic. And thank you, Councillor Sabi George, for your leadership, leadership on this issue. And thank you also to Councillors Edward and Bob for leading the way on AFFH and shaping that policy for the city. Thank you. And then are we just going to go now through questions? Yeah, OK. So we'll just go ahead and start with the lead sponsor, and we'll go in order of arrival. Great. Go ahead. Thank you uh, very much, Madam Chair. I have a quick follow-up question to the presentation Amelia gave, which I thought was fantastic and very informative. Um, great, you know, a great presentation, sort of the real numbers and what we need to see. You mentioned on the sober homes that there's only uh, 27 in the city and only in three communities. Is that beca because those are the sober homes that are currently certified as we know that the certification process isn't mandated? Is that accurate? Yep, that's correct. And sorry um, uh, about my connection before I heard someone trying to speak to me and couldn't respond. <laughs> but um, yes, um, that is correct. Those are certified um, only, although I did follow up um, about that and learned that most of them, most of the sober homes in the city are certified anyway. So this is not Cover, it's covering most of the universe. Um, that's what I was told. It sounds like that might not be the case, but yeah, that's I mean, the I data think, that we have. Yeah, I'd yeah. say that's likely not the case based just okay. on the, just sort of the anecdotal ones I know in communities that weren't, because I think on that list, if I remember, it was Dorchester, Boston and Roxbury. East, yeah. Yep. And, you know, there's many more than that. South, I mean, South, 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 yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I think that we could probably go through maybe even outside, you know, obviously outside of this hearing and just go through to make sure that we have an accurate listing. 
or as accurate of a listing as possible because that's um, that's missing missing a lot. It's, that that's it. And we, we don't have to harp on. It. I think that there is better. We can find that. Um, anyway, so I, I am curious. Um, just sort of in general, when a developer comes to the table with a proposal uh, for a project, what are the policies or considerations that come into place to shape that development? Do we um, do we look at like what was recently built or do we say, OK, well, this was recently built, so let's do some larger size units or or smaller size units, although I think, you know, and in, in your presentation and in the presentation, we see how many of the units are really on the smaller side. Um, you know, how do we, how do we determine or how do we direct a developer to build more of a different type of housing? I'm really interested in how do we create more opportunities for larger sized housing um, for, for families. So that's really been the highlight of doing our AFFH work, which um, really only was just implemented on the 15th. So just about um, three weeks ago. So we've been kind of on an education and outreach tour with the developers and walking them through the housing and household community profile report that I spoke of um, and really highlighting, you know, the elements of the community that maybe have traditionally been overlooked, you know, looking a lot at income, race and ethnicity, and other things like that because they're so they're interfacing with the community through community meetings but really highlighting um, household sizes and unit sizes and asking developers to take a meaningful look at what they're seeing in that report um, and i can provide a, a sample of that as well or or demonstrate it if it helps to provide more context um, but just asking developers and highlighting that information as part of the meaningful asfh assessment um, to take a look at you know what, what are your plans Tell us both what you're planning and how, and describe in your AFFH responses how that meets the community need, while also welcoming in people who may have traditionally been um, uh, underrepresented in the community. So that work is taking place as part of kind of the, the overall education and outreach for AFFH. Great. And then um, just a, maybe one more question for at least this round, and I'll save the rest of my colleagues. Amelia talked a, a little bit, had one that one particular uh, slide on artist housing across our city, which, you know, it's great to see that there is some in the pipeline. It's great to see that some of it has some affordability restrictions to it. Um, do we have an idea on how deep those affordability restrictions go? And then also when we're working on developing or with those artist um, spaces that are in the pipeline, are we looking to make sure that it's appropriately built, thinking about the medium because, uh, an, you know, if you're building a, a, a development with 20 units in it, you don't say, okay, these three are artist live workspaces and just make them such because of, you know, equipment needs. Um, you know, if you've got a kiln, you need certain, it's going to be able to carry a certain weight. You may need water, um, access to different sinks and, you know, soundproofing if it's a, some sort of performance art. It, are we putting those considerations into place with the developments? And then, you know, something that I've heard from the artist community, I know Council Braden has heard it from the artist community because we've been in some meetings together. I don't see her on the screen anymore. Um, you know, some of the, you know, I like when we're doing, whether it's affordable housing or sort of special housing on site. I'm not a big believer in doing things off site, but certain types of housing do need some unique or should have some unique characteristics like artist housing. Maybe there is community space, maybe there is shared um, uh, creative space. So, you know, is there an opportunity to explore that, look at that, because that may be the better option. Um, so I'll actually be taking that question. So I'm Lizzie Torres, work at the BPDA for housing policy with Michelle McCarthy. Um, but most of my focus has actually been on artist live work space housing. Um, the range of those AMIs, um, because of data that uh, arts and culture actually provided us, we started to notice that more of the artist live uh, income needs were actually more in the 40% to 60% AMI range. So we have been trying to focus on making sure that any artist housing, when it's being requested, or if it's looking to be built by the developer proactively already, that we are having uh, honest discussions about what kind of income restrictions are actually going to be required to actually provide the need to the artists who are currently looking for artist live workspace. 
The other thing we have been working on is um, we are in the um, draft phase of creating artist live work guidelines with developers, with arts and culture, and with lots of focus groups by the artist community of Boston to actually have conversations about mediums, materials, community uh, spaces, and all sorts of uh, soundproofing or for different types of artwork spaces, right? So we hear a lot of um, need for things like woodworking shops that have require some sort of soundproofing, um, lighting that is required for, you know, painting or photography or something like that. And they don't necessarily need to be all in the same place, but we need to be more conscious and mm -hmm. understand that not every single artist live workspace is created equal. And so making sure that when we market them, that we market them on for what kinds of mediums they would be most appropriate for. Um, and then right now, I think there's just been a lot of focus on making sure that we're even providing the idea when it's appropriate. So is it in a location that's near an artist workspace already? Or are we actually starting to see a budding um, creative community in that area right now that it would make more sense to actually start building them in a new place where they aren't? Um, so you saw that Roxbury right now, we have a huge artist you know, community over there that has not been attended to for a bit. So we have a lot of them in the pipeline over there. There. Alston, you know, is very much known for having a huge community, but there is a dearth of affordability um, components to the affordable housing for live work spaces. So that's when where our focus has been there. Great. I appreciate that you are especially focused on that because it's so important to have someone that is sort of, you know, just paying attention to that particular uh, piece. And um, with the surveys, and, and I know Council Braid and I have talked to artists who have participated in those surveys. And we've talked to some of the commissioners around that work because you do want to build and create where and what an artist needs. Um, so I'm happy, happy to hear that that work is ongoing and underway. Thanks, Lizzie. I'll save my quest the rest of my questions for the next round. Thank you, Councillor Flynn. Then Councillor Braden has stepped away. So Mejia, you'll be after Councillor Flynn. Thank you, Councillor Edwards. And I'm glad, Lizzie, to know that you're working closely on housing for the artist community. I think that's, I think that's great, especially I have a large artist community in, in district two as well in the South end and the waterfront. And I know they add tremendous value to the, to the city and to the neighborhoods. Um, I just had a couple of follow-up questions, um, maybe one for Amelia or for Tim. Um, Tim, historically the South end has always been at, correct me if I'm wrong, but about 50% subsidized housing. And then I noticed the stat today was around 34%. Is, is, is there a discrepancy there? Uh, no, sir, there's not a discrepancy, but there is a different uh, boundary line that we're using. Um, the Boston, the Department of Neighborhood Development has traditionally used what we call planning districts as our boundaries, which for the South End was really the South End, Bay Village, and Lower Roxbury. Um, and so because we are trying to unify how we represent our data with the BPDA, we are now using a South End boundary that is more truly what most people consider to be the South End. And so those Lower Roxbury projects, Roxbury Crossing, Grant Manor, I mean, there's a number of projects in that area that are now part of the Roxbury numbers. So nothing moved, but we're using those boundaries so that we're more aligned across the city on all our reporting. So that's a very good and an understandable question. Okay, no, thank, thank you, Tim, that's helpful. Um, I was just concerned about it because I was thinking- <laughs> Certainly. With, um, with all the development taking place, maybe we weren't adding the, um, affordable housing aspect to it, but um, thank you for your answer. Um, I'm also cons I'm also a strong advocate, and I know Sheila Dillon has been as well in, in Mayor Walsh, but I've also been a strong advocate for uh, veteran housing, housing for our veterans. What is BPDA or DND going to do as we go forward in maybe trying to add veteran housing and let me let me offer one um, opportunity if anyone wants to come down to into my district in the south boston waterfront we have a lot of land i'd love to see veteran housing built down there um, anyone interested in coming down there and building veteran housing how about you tim 
Um, I will have, I'll have to take that message back to our other senior staff. I'm not on the development side of this picture. Um, we certainly, I mean, we're very pleased with some of our recent work with the residences at Brighton Marine, for example. Mm -hmm. um, we're very pleased with our work around vouchers for veterans uh, and that work. Um, but certainly, I will take that message back to the development side of our agency. Yeah, thank, thank you, Tim. I had a, um, a virtual um, tour of Brighton Marine last week with their staff and the program and the housing aspect. Um, they offer there is exceptional, probably one of the best, one of the best in the country. And I'd love to see about getting a couple of those built throughout the city, not necessarily my district, although I'd welcome that certainly, but I'd love to see two or three of those types of facilities built across the city. And hopefully, um, you know, we can work together and maybe trying to get at least one, one built somewhere over the next year or two years, but I um, want to say thank you to Councillor Edwards and to my uh, colleague, Councillor Asabi George, and the city administration and the advocates as well. Thank you. Councillor Mejia? I'm just loving Councillor Flynn. He's bringing the fire. Yes, Flynn, loving it. I, I'm just, just like all about this right now. Um, so just really quick, I'm just curious about how are we determining the neighborhoods with large percentage of senior housing that are subsidized? You know, I'm just curious about neighborhoods like Chinatown, which have a higher population of elders and yet they're ranked pretty low on the list. And then I'm also curious about affordable housing for LGBTQ youth and those who are aging out of foster care. I think it's a good way for us to think, you know, to think about the concern of over quote unquote family units being taken up by roommates because a lot of people, especially LGBTQ youth, the only family they have are in the safe spaces that they call home and family always is in blood. So I'm just curious about what that looks like. And for folks listening in, could you say what a permanent supportive housing unit is and how is and how that's different from section eight or any other type of public housing? Um, I'll let Michelle do the definition of permanent supportive housing because of her previous work in this area. Um, in terms of LGBTQ uh, housing, um, there are, we are very interested in looking at places and opportunities to do things for youth, um, to do, uh, we are, of course, we are funding a um, LGBTQ focused senior project in Hyde Park, uh, which we hope will start construction soon. Uh, that's a, a really nice project and there was a really good group of grassroots folks who really came together with a developer to bring that to us. And we're using a former middle school will be for that project. Uh, so I think I, I myself am very interested in those issues myself and very supportive of our work to try to move forward with more opportunities for housing options for people who are LGBTQ um, and non-binary and other kind of non-traditional uh, uh, people uh, in terms of how we look at our world. Um, I'll turn over to Michelle wait, to answer wait, that. I'm sorry, uh, could, could we just uh, lean in a little bit more in terms of for the students sure. who are aging out of foster care? I'm also concerned and curious about what type of uh, housing are we look, you know, to support uh, students who are aging out of foster care um, just, and I'm also just curious while we're talking about vulnerable populations, um, you know, affordable is depending on how much you make is how much you're able to afford here in the city of Boston. And so looking at also what are we doing around affordability for not just artists, but people who um, I would say are city workers, you know, some of them are, are, are can't even afford to live in the city of Boston. And, and some of them are living in apartments with five or six other people just to be able to have a Boston residency so that they can stay here in the city of Boston. So I'm just curious about a number of different vulnerable populations. Can you speak a little bit to that as well? Um, I would have to actually defer to some of our other staff on that to maybe get back to you. Um, I will see if Jessica Boatwright can join us um, to talk about that topic now. And if she can't, we can certainly have her follow up with you later. 
um, because I don't know the status of our work around uh, youth aging out of foster care, for example. I look forward to that. But um, all right, permanent, let's talk a little bit about defining what um, permanent supportive housing units, what is that? Let's talk a little bit about that. Great, thank you for that question. Uh, love the opportunity to talk about um, homeless services and supporting formerly homeless people since that was my, um, the, the career I transitioned from out of into the policy manager job. So permanent supportive housing is basically a affor affordable housing subsidy that's paired with supportive services um, for people who are, are experience chronic homelessness and chronic homelessness is defined as, um, it's a complex definition because it's a federal definition. So, you know, there's gonna be problems when, when you start getting the federal definition sometimes um, defined as a cumulative year long of homelessness coupled with a disability that impairs your ability to kind of live independently in the community. So the services are targeted towards um, helping people who have had long experiences in homelessness um, be able to gain the skills that they may be lost or never had in terms of being able to understand leases, understand talking to a landlord, um, paying, paying utilities if that's something that might be part of the housing um, and just really kind of developing, giving people the space to develop the life skills and other um, services they need in terms of mental health, physical health, substance use, anything like that um, while taking advantage of the affordable housing subsidy. Oh, looks like you're muted. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> um, Chairwoman Edwards, could one more question or the, just to follow up quickly, if that's okay, or? That's fine. Okay, thank you. I'm just curious, is this um, for all individuals or are we looking just for at, at families or women? You know, I, I've worked in the shelter space um, and worked with a lot of women who were transitioning out of shelter. And so I know a lot of effort is made um, for families. And I'm just curious, again, going back to this whole notion that not everybody in the city of Boston is part of a family unit. Are we looking at this? from a, a diversity and inclus inclusion of all the residents of the city of Boston? Yeah, so unlike the state shelter system, which is really targeted towards families, the permanent supportive housing, as it's, but the majority of it is funded by HUD, is really for everyone. Um, a lot of individual homelessness and people transitioning out. Um, so really it's it's anyone who qualifies under the, the HUD rules, uh, regardless of household size. So they regard a household as being as small as one to you know as many people as exist in the household. Thank you for that, Michelle. Thank you, Councillor Edwards. Thank you. Um, I just had some quick comments and then we'll go into the second round. But um, I, well, first of all, I really appreciate the comprehensive view of, of the housing stock. I don't think in all the hearings I've had, we really just pulled back at this level. So thank you, Councillor Sabi George, for even calling this hearing. And thank you, Amelia, for that kind of comprehensive breakdown. Um, I am. Um, I think. Uh, I think was Amelia responsible for the displacement mapping back in the day. Yes. 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 Yeah. Amelia and we also had an intern named Bailey Hugh who worked on that with us as well. Yeah. So that's what I was, the question I was originally trying to ask. Her where we were like, "Hello, hello. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now?" That back and forth because I had, I had the pleasure of working with Amelia when we did when I was at the Office of Housing Stability and she did this heat map based on displacement emergencies based off of eviction data. So. I've been so familiar with her work and the, the team's work in being able to do that. So I want to say thank you for that. Thank you for this. And then um, my understanding, Michelle, then is with this kind of comprehensive understanding, that's really what AFFH starts with. So that this really, this really would allow for the, we'll just use a real life example, right? Of Suffolk Downs. So Suffolk Downs is coming by East Boston. And they propose all these different things that are completely the opposite of what the neighborhood looks like. The question then becomes, is this new development inclusive of the folks who live there, right? Is really being pathways for folks to come into the new housing and pathways for, to, to those new jobs, to the new transportation opportunities, which Suffolk Downs now is because it has two T-stops. It's gonna create all these new jobs and so on and so forth. So when you have a new development, you look at the surrounding communities around it 
and you say, does each one of these communities have access to this new development or this new PDA? Is that at the 30,000 foot view? That is the view. That is the view I have. Just taking a look, making sure that developers are starting from a baseline where it's not just anecdotal evidence, but it's data driven. So they're looking, they're actually looking and demonstrated that they're, they've looked at the surrounding community um, because they have described in a narrative as part of the AFFH assessment, how the proposed development meets the needs of the community and rather than just selecting a number and then hoping for the best. Right, which is what uh, traditionally they've, they've been able to focus on the four walls of the building they're building. Mm -hmm. And they'll just yep. be like, well, that is what it is. And we'll give some mitigation towards, you know, Little League or something like that. But now we're like, you, you don't, you bought the whole thing. You bought the neighborhood, you bought the history of it. You bought also what this future could be. So therefore you've got to look at what you've bought realistically, right? And so I'm really excited about that conversation. I'm really excited about the, the, the way this map is looking. Um, I did, I uh, wanted, I wanted to just also make sure I was clear on some of the numbers. I mean, Dorchester is just, it's just big because it's for Dorchester, right? It also has a majority of the housing unit period. Right. Okay. Yes, so, that's correct. Okay. I'm just making sure of that. And then in terms of the, um, now that we have kind of this understanding of what we look like, I guess maybe the next round of questions and maybe to the lead sponsor is, so now we know what we look like. Do we have a vision towards what we actually want to be? Right. So seeing what we are, you see the disparate I mean, it follows the red line, right? Where the concentrations of the most subsidized and the most public housing is in Roxbury and communities of color. And that's not just because of need, that's also because of just shoving them out of other neighborhoods. Let's be very clear about it, the history we have in Boston, right? And so some of that is the generational kind of pain and, and, and discrimination and segregation that we have today. So, all right, so we have what we have. And we're going to be building because we have what nine billion dollars, I think, just in yet this year alone of construction projects coming up. So, how do we do a visioning exercise? I know we did Boston 2030, but how do we do a visioning exercise based off these pain points? I'm I'm really excited about that. Actually, I think we're setting a legal standard so that we have to do it. So when we do it, what what are we heading towards as a city? Anybody could be the lead sponsor, could be Lindsay, could be Joel, could be whoever. I'm curious. Well, the one thing I, the one thing I would sort of say to that, uh, Councillor Edwards, Chair Edwards, and sort of my initial response to that, and to the question just previous that you asked, you know, we look at what's um, what a community or a neighborhood, depending on how sort of hyper local we get when we when we analyze that and look at the next development. Um, but we also have to, I think, take into consideration some of the significant changes a neighborhood has gone through, um, especially in the last, you know, 10 to 20 years. Um, and, you know, one of the things and, and one of my hopes and one of the outcomes I had hoped from today's discussion would be, um, you know, at least a direction headed towards creating opportunities for more family sized housing in the city, but then we bump up and we have to, I think we have to talk about it out loud that in order, if we were to build three family sized units mm -hmm. versus nine single bedroom units that, you know, there is a, there is a cost associated with those two things to the um, buyer or the renter. And that's, I think, an important distinction to also make. Like we've got to, like we have to create more family housing, but family housing can't be expensive because we want families to be able to afford it. So we find ourselves, you know, stuck in in a particular place. But also, I think it's important to look at some of the historical context of some of our neighborhoods that maybe once were largely inhabited by families. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think we also, when we look at that data that Amelia showed, we also want to make sure that we're creating opportunities for ownership. And we you know, continue to talk about the, in other spaces, the wealth gap. Well, if we're not creating more affordable ownership opportunities, that wealth gap is going to persist, period. End of sentence. Um, um, I think my my question, and it's it's I'm agreeing with you with everything you said, but just to direct the, what you're saying, my question would, would be more, not so much should or shouldn't we, 
but in the visions that we have, where? Where, where do we need to create more family housing? I saw on one of the slides with Amelia, downtown is basically like said families aren't welcome here, but the way that it's been developed. I mean, that's what it looked like. It looked like, like families don't bother to come here. We're not gonna have a downtown family. And maybe, I mean, we only have one school, at least the, the public school, the Otis. I'm sorry, the Otis, I'm sorry, the- um, Quincy. In the North End. And oh, I forget about the Kurt. Elliot. Elliot. Curtis. It was going to go through every East Boston elementary school. Sorry. But so maybe, I mean, but why? Um, that's my question, right? So we know we need certain things, but where should they go? Um, and so, and, and that's the visioning kind of thing. It, can we get the city to agree on that? We need more family housing downtown just as much as we need them in the neighborhoods, or maybe we don't. Maybe it's not worth it to us because it's too expensive to do it downtown. We'd rather just build for families. In the neighborhoods, that's the kind of the, the questions that I have. And then I'm gonna I'm, one last thing, and then I'll I'll go through the round again. I really do want us to come up with regulations for floating houses. I'm gonna bring that up every single every single hearing because there's a hundred beautiful units that are floating in Charlestown, or that could be floating in Charlestown, but they they basically are like yeah, affordable stuff. We're not really housing, so we don't really have to do any of that. So I really do want that to be part of our vision where you could have floating houses. Cause I think while we, I think our communities are okay with growing out. We don't have any land, but we do have a lot of water. So that could be an option as well. So. Um, Councilor Sabi George. Yeah, sure, thanks. I didn't know if anybody else wanted to add in or chime in to that. It felt like a working session for a moment there. Um, <clears throat> so one, um, you know, one of the, the questions I have is around the homeless housing set aside. You know, we, we talked a little bit about artist housing. We talked about some of the other types of housing. How, you know, what are the barriers to families and individuals accessing the homeless set aside? And how do we create more of those opportunities? And, you know, I, I, I say, you know, I asked that question because I think many of you know that that work has been really important to me. But I, and I also understand sort of the challenges when we create too many set asides then there's just there isn't going to be a, a, a critical mass of anything when we we can we consider all those set asides but the homeless set aside something that's important you know it's something that I think we should do more of and, you know are there particular barriers to creating more homeless set asides can anyone speak to that um, I, I'll attempt to uh, you know I think for those of you on the call that aren't aware of this for D and D funded uh, rental projects we're requesting we're requiring a 10% set aside. Um, one of the reasons why it's only 10% is also because those are units that are affordable to households at 30% of AMI or less. And we almost always have to pair a voucher of some type, whether it's a project based or some other kind of voucher type with the unit so that it can be affordable. So um, obviously the more, I think the more operating subsidies we have in terms of vouchers, the probably the more that we could do um, we do have some projects that have done more. We also are working a lot with our new federal resources that have become because of the COVID funding bills. We are uh, advancing some work to do some rapid rehousing uh, work for families. Um, and so that is going to be, that's starting to roll out now. Um, and so there's a lot, and that's going to, and we're going to be using some of our rental, uh, basically our rental relief funds and other funds that we're getting from the federal government to really support uh, families who have experienced homelessness to get into and stay in homes. And luckily some of the newest money coming from the Biden administration has longer timelines so that we can assure both the tenant and the landlord who wants to know that that, that tenant can actually stay. Uh, so that's, that's some really great work we're working on um, and also, I know that uh, I'm not directly involved in it, but I know that other staff are directly involved on the homeless, uh, the family homelessness committee that's being set up. So that's going to, yeah, I think, provide us some other solutions and some other ways forward on that. That's great. And I'm glad that you are considerate of the timeline piece because, you know, setting up some of these efforts and then, you know, in, in you know, a year or two years even to pull the rug out from underneath families and residents is just, that's not, that's not productive for the long term. When we think about our lower income families in particular have, you know, and I think that this came up in the hearing the other day, one of the, one of the hearings the other day 
are we looking as a city to purchase um, or is the BH is BHA looking to purchase any additional land or find some creative opportunities to build new housing outside of um, some of the mixed use private private public partnership efforts. Yeah, yeah. So echoing what Sheila Dillon said on the call, the meeting the other day, um, we do, you know, we are actively looking to purchase existing uh, rental properties and income restrict them. Those are coast mostly to help existing tenants stay in their homes so they will have a range of incomes as any building naturally will have. Mm -hmm. uh, but we do have working with um, a fund through CDAC, there is funds for buying land as well. Right. Um, it's certainly not the kind of big land purchases we would like to see, um, and, but maybe we certainly are interested in those opportunities going forward. Yeah, and the maintaining of affordable of affordability and, and maintaining those um, those restrictions is certainly an important piece, but that's like the little Band-Aid on a, a big wound. Um, we need to just find ways to create that additional housing. I saw that Joel and maybe David came off mute for a second there, if they've got something to add to that. Go ahead, Joel. Oh, you're, you're. We seem to be having that problem today. One of those days. And, and and while we're waiting for while we're waiting for just a second, I did uh, connect with Jessica, um, with Jessica Boatwright from our office. There, the neighborhood housing division is very much interested in working at some more projects that work on how to address the issues of, of youth aging out of foster care. Mm -hmm. um, we do have a youth uh, homelessness report or plan that was released in 2019 on our website. If you're interested in that. Um, and also the Neighborhood Housing Trust specifically has expressed interest in this issue as well. Um, so I think that's good. Um, and, and so I will leave that there and maybe we have uh, Joel coming back in a second. Or we and can while, go to Joel, while Joel is coming back, there's also some of the um, reports that went through for the, youth, for the youth piece on um, through like Bridge Over Troubled Waters was the, the facilitator of some of those efforts around housing for youth. Hi, Joel. Good, good afternoon, uh, Councillor. Again, sorry for the technical difficulties that seem to be plaguing uh, myself and others. Um, I just wanted to add the, so the BHA is not looking to purchase land per se. We do, however, have existing parcels that are either, uh, let's say, not as dense as they could be, or in some cases not developed. So um, partially um, in conversation with, well, with D&D &D as well as um, Councillor Bach, uh, who is the predecessor in my current role, um, in looking at where we could look at targeted sort of density or targeted construction. Um, uh, the, the short answer is we are, we are looking not at land acquisition, but what we can do on existing land that the BHA owns um, as one of the multiple tools in the toolkit. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Appreciate the, the follow-up questions. Um, I can't, is Councillor, Councillor Mejia, if you have any follow-up questions. Oh, sorry, Councillor Edward, you got me eating gluten-free chips here. So um, I, I don't have any further questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think what I would also, um, I would just maybe direct the conversation a little bit towards uh, BHA specifically and how, um, as you're redeveloping the housing developments, which is a comprehensive long-term capital plan. And in some cases resulting in some folks having to leave off site and some and, and, and vouchers moving around, how are you, um, or what is your what is your version of dealing with the AFFH and making sure that the we don't recreate concentrations of poverty, but we're also making sure that our most vulnerable populations are are adequately housed in Boston. So I think, um, thank you, um, Councillor, and and. 
Uh, I think, David, if you want to jump in after this in terms of if there's anything relevant to the voucher programs or some of the transitional components, please do. Um, I think there are a couple of things. One is that as a directly HUD regulated um, entity, and, and of course the city is also receiving funds, we have um, substantial, I think, body of regulation that we have to follow generally and beyond what is obligatory. Um, I think that under uh, administrator Bennett, there's been a real significant focus on increasing uh, racial equity and fair housing analysis throughout the organization and really every aspect of that. Um, with regard to redevelopment activity, which runs through our RED or real estate development, uh, I think that there are, are two components. One is that there's the sort of the, the language of the deals and the agreements um, that um, that's codified in the relationship between BHA's ground lease and a, and a new sort of private actor's um, ownership of the building and the, the legal protections that are afforded to tenants through that ground lease. Additionally, because of, and particularly because those projects um, involve private development or, or because they involve large development generally, they do go through zoning. So in addition to sort of the process between BHA and a private actor, um, those large projects would now, I think, be subject to some of the same AFFH review that the, because of the zoning. So mm -hmm. there's, I think, a couple, a couple layers, a couple areas. Um, I do think that there are some additional pieces to that, um, two of which is just in any kind of redevelopment project, thinking about what's the, in, so if there's a one-for-one -one affordability replacement, just being considerate uh, and thoughtful over time over the type and size and whatnot of unit. And the city, of course, for its part, has really fought for a number of uh, tools for, uh, I think, you know, certainly some of the, um, uh, Tim and Michelle, I think, have brought up in the past some of the, you know, the inclusionary development using zoning and square footage, and there's a lot of tools there. But the, the BHA also, I think, can be considered about that in terms of what it's asking of private developers and how we're working um, it, it, with with um, the city and district uh, elected officials in that regard. Um, I think the relocate, as, as you know from Charlestown in particular, some of the relocation parts I think are really key here. And so the, the phasing of buildings is one part, and then there are some level of um, tenant protection vouchers and other and other components that play into that as well. So I think I'll stop there. I'll see if David wants to add anything and then turn it back. Uh, I'll, I'll just add that we, you know, we, we uh, implemented small area fair market rents for our voucher program, which I think has been helpful in allowing uh, families to choose uh, neighborhoods that they have not traditionally chosen within Boston. And so we're starting to see incremental changes with respect to concentrations of our voucher holders and families moving to uh, neighborhoods that they did move to, to before, you know, specifically uh, Roslindale, West Roxbury. We're seeing more people move to those neighborhoods than we have in the past. So that's a positive thing. Uh, additionally, uh, with respect to project-based vouchers and um, uh, small area fair market, fair market rents, they do allow uh, potentially developments to occur in uh, some higher cost neighborhoods where previously they, they, they wouldn't. So we're starting to see some proposals that come in uh, in those higher cost neighborhoods. Of course, there's always a balance between uh, the per unit cost and the number of families we have to serve, but you know th there is some. Um, uh, we are starting to see some changes because of that uh, policy change, and um, so and those PBVs are a great tool uh, 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 as well. Uh, with the uh, purchasing that DND is doing, we are often able to couple those PBVs to keep those properties uh, affordable for low income families as they as they uh, make those purchases. So. Um, but Joel, Joel did a great job, I think, covering most of it. I don't know if I had anything else, Joel, uh, that uh, you want to comment on, but uh, no, I thank think you. It was, I think to your point, the fact that we have the new SFMR, the small area um, uh, increased vouchers, we saw it, for example, in Charlestown, the average voucher went up almost $1,300 and it gave people purchasing, but if we don't build for them, if you know, it doesn't matter if your voucher is higher, if you're 
if downtown again is what we just saw is still a lot of one bedrooms and studios and is not being built for more families, it doesn't matter, right? You can't compete. Even people, even families that could compete aren't gonna move down there. So that's just, that's not BHA. That's just literally if the city isn't preparing for families to come in and demanding that there be more two, three, four bedrooms in certain areas, we won't get more families there. Um, but I do, do, you brought up the voucher program and I'm wondering how um, the vouchers, the new city voucher program is going um, and how that might also help um, with housing choice, not as the program housing choice, but in terms of housing, like choices that people have. Yep, so I can answer that in two parts. Um, and yeah, so, so David runs our, our voucher, or generally our voucher programs, and I specifically for the city voucher have helped to co-design the program with him. Um, for the city voucher, um, BHA began really designing this program with um, advocates and D&D at the table uh, last March, so um, about a year ago, right? Um, and for context, that was prior to it being funded. So we got to that, you know, tr to try to move that process and have a, a consultatory process with community stakeholders um, that have pushed for the program. Um, since that time, you know, we, we, we ironed out sort of the relationship um, between BHA, the city, and several um, ways of being, the, the pathways uh, sort of for entering into that. And we also have sort of issued a request for proposals that's open on a rolling basis. It's currently open. Um, so we are in the process now of reviewing that initial set of um, proposals for funding and can still take applications. The way that the program is structured, I do think it's relevant to this, uh, to the, the last set of questions at least. And the reason for that is um, one of the primary purposes is to make some existing income restricted units more affordable. So for example, if something is restricted at 60% AMI um, or what's often referred to as tax credit rents, it may be made affordable to someone who's earning in the 30% or household earning at the sort of the 30% or at the 40% level. So some of the CDC projects or um, other other low-income housing tax credit projects, should they choose to go after this subsidy, could be made affordable um, to something that um, matches the economic profile of a lot of uh, low, extremely low-income um, Bostonians. I think from a fair housing perspective, that's helpful, um, uh, and it's it's helping. I think um, f uh, close the gap in some instances. Um, so we will be awarding those, but um, it, because of the, the substantial time and the sort of design and the fact that we really wanted to work with advocates, it has taken a while to, um, it's been an intentional process, I think. Um, so we're very pleased to be having applications to review and hoping to get money at the door as soon as possible. I'm excited for them to get online though, honestly. I mean, it's um, it's one of the things that, you know, makes us again a leader in this case, in this conversation that the city would come up with their own. And I know the city is committed to making sure that immigration status isn't part of that calculus um, for the city-based vouchers, or at least, especially if it's helping you to deepen, that, that, that means a lot for a lot of my constituents, I'm sure for Councillor Mejia's and obviously Councillor Asabi George's constituents, all of ours, it means a lot. Um, so I'm gonna turn it back over to Councillor Asabi George. Yeah, I just have a quick comment uh, and then a, a quick question. I guess I'll start with a question and the comment. The other day in, in one of our multiple hearings, you know, we had there was a discussion around the opportunity to fast track certain projects, especially ones that were 100% affordable, deeply affordable projects. I'm like all in for that. I think that's a, that's fantastic if we can look for those opportunities. I wonder though, with BHA in particular um, and with our vouchers. If we were to start looking at any sort of opportunities for fast tracking, do we have the capacity to meet the needs with, with vouchers? I guess that's my question. I, uh, um, I mean, I guess I just have a clarifying question. I mean, we're talking about PBVs, I suppose, or? Um... Well, I just wanna make sure that where, where, we, can, where we can push um, building, uh, especially on the affordable pieces that we have the vouchers and 
in hand or available that we're not going to run out because those vouchers can be tricky and there's some difficulty sometimes in planning for them and they become surprise gifts or we're sort of waiting on the timing and we hear rumblings that they might be coming but we don't know exactly when they're coming so we want to make sure that any any push that we do to create more opportunities that there's the voucher available for ideally a family um to to use it uh, yeah, I mean, with with respect to development, and we it, the, the the budget is very difficult to anticipate from the the federal program, which is the you know uh, is where our funding comes from. Uh, we actually just received our we we know it when we we just found out finally what we're going to receive for calendar year 2021, for example. However, with with PBVs, and typically there is significant lead time, so we you know. For, we, we have a couple projects in the pipeline right now that are looking to come online in 23 and 24. And so typically we have quite a bit of lead time with respect to those PBV projects. And we can always kind of figure out how to set them aside for the coming years so that we have those, you know, so that we can support the projects that we, that we want to support. And so it hasn't been a problem yet. We, we figure out how to either um, set that, those vouchers aside or request additional funding as is permitted when we we don't seem to have enough uh, under the under the HUD uh, notices. So um, I think there there's always a way to try to figure those out uh, those projects out. We don't have an endless supply, but we seem to be able to as long as there's kind of a, a good time frame in front of us to, to to figure that out. Oh, that's great to hear. I appreciate that. And I I just I wanted uh, my comment. I suppose my note is this has been a fairly quick hearing. I think on a large topic. And I think that speaks to certainly some of the ground that we covered the other day, but I think more so to the opening presentation that Amelia, Amelia gave. I, I hope that that um, slide deck is in our inboxes or could be in our inboxes because I found that um, information very, very helpful, very detailed. And I look forward to sort of picking at it a little bit more independently. So I may send out um, some additional follow-up questions after that that opportunity. I'd also say that we do have to go back and take a look at that sober housing slide in particular. So, you know, Madam um, Chair, I don't know whether that happens in this working session, or I'd have to go through the green sheets and see if we had perhaps a standing hearing. You know, I know um, Mayor Janey has called for that hearing. I've done that in partnership with her over the last few years. So I'm not sure if that's been a refile or not. Mm -hmm. So I'll go back and look on that, but where it was brought up here, maybe we don't need a separate hearing order maybe just a working session on that piece in particular, because I know in a couple of our neighborhoods, that's a that's a particular concern um, as well. So Amelia, if we could make sure that we have that slide deck, that'd be helpful. Um, Chair Edwards, I do see that um, Council Mejia still has her hand up. So I'm yep. not wrapping up Council Mejia, I just, I'm wrapping up my own questions. I do see that Tim maybe has a response to me as well. Yeah, I, I was just gonna say, thank you very much. I wanna really thank Amelia for the work she did on this and she will get that presentation to you. Um, I, I, speaking specifically on both the, the uh, supportive housing and the sober housing data, that was actually a new data sources that we pulled specifically to address this order. So we appreciate the time and effort we can take after this to kind of get that into better shape and have uh, that as another part of our data that we keep on, a, on an ongoing basis. So those were new data sets for us. Great, and then Councilor Mejia. So sorry, I put my hand up because I wasn't, I had my mute off because I was, my daughter was distracting me. So I, I wasn't sure if you had called upon me, Councilor Edwards, but I do have one more question if that's still okay. Yep. Okay. Um, so I'm just curious, you know, I'm going back to the, the diversity housing, right? And I also think about college students. Um, you know, we, we have a lot of students here who grew up in the city of Boston, who can't afford to stay here. So I just want to kind of include them in this conversation in terms of like housing for students who are from Boston and not to say that other students who are not, but just like what kind of pathway are we creating for Boston public school students who have graduated from our city schools who, who, who want to be able to stay here, you know, that would be another area of, of interest for me. And then I'm also curious about, there are a lot of folks who, because of their, uh, their income, 
that they fall sometimes maybe like two or three thousand dollars over what the affordable income you know subsidy requirements are and i'm just curious what if any efforts are being made to help support some of these uh, families who are at you know a, a, a hair or two um, over the subsidy housing um, requirements So I, I think I'll take the, the first the first question is really a, a comment on the things that we need to be thinking about. And we really do appreciate that in terms of how do we make sure that students who are from here can stay here. I think that in terms of looking at the income requirements, I mean, many of those are set by the federal government. Um, it is always a proverbial problem about what to do about the folks who are just a little, makes just a little bit more than what the income uh, maximums are for a program. And that's one reason why um, we at our agency have been committed to providing units at a range of incomes um, and providing people who can kind of a ladder towards housing opportunities. So they may not be income eligible for a one kind of rental unit, but they may be income eligible for home ownership assistance where they can actually buy something the down payment assistance in the regular market. So it, it means a full range of things. And there probably is always gonna be um, some families who are not gonna be eligible for one program or another. Um, and that, that's, that's always the problem of balancing out, serving those with the most need and making sure that we have a range of income served. So I don't know if anyone else wants to respond to that from the, the city team, but that's, I think that's, I kind of, that's kind of our uh, balancing act we have. I think it's a similar concern about our with our conversations around IDP and how we're changing that as a city and just thinking about making sure um, units are available and we're setting those ceilings at reasonable levels and that we think of them as ceilings and not floors in terms of income limits, like that the, the upper limit and that the intent is that people below that limit should be able to afford that unit. Um, so just thinking of it that way and thinking of the, the idea of um, all the different subsidy sources, federal, state, local funding sources, and how they have um, different requirements and limits and in, in creating a structure that's not duplicative of um, other sources, but supportive of those other sources and creating um, housing at a range. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, if there's no other questions from my colleagues, I'm probably gonna go ahead and end this a little early, um, mostly because I think we're gonna come back to this conversation. I'll talk with the lead sponsor about maybe we wanna focus the next concentration on one of the larger populations that we've just learned about and visioning maybe specifically for fa uh, family housing or visioning specifically around sober housing. But uh, this was an incredible overall conversation. And I just really, again, thank you so much for the data. Thank you all for making yourselves present. Um, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and close out the hearing unless Councillor uh, Sabi George has any, nope, no concluding remarks. All right, everyone, have a good one. Thanks everyone, that was great. Thank you, Amelia. Everybody else too did great, but I really appreciate the PowerPoint. Absolutely, you're very welcome, Councillor. Looking yeah. forward to following up with you on sober housing for sure. Yeah, very good, have a great day.